Okay, so <clears throat> returning back to the Spengler project, um, uh, and back to the chapter on destiny and causality, we're up to page 136 in my edition, which is subsection 6. But first what I want to do is look at this chart that was sent to me uh, by one of my listeners here, uh, a man named Roger Mull, if I'm pronouncing it right. He can read German, and what he's doing is he's gone back to read uh, Spengler's unfinished uh, opus, Frutzeit der Weltgeschichte, which means basically the dawn of world history. Um, and he's got that idea. I like, I like it translated that way uh, as dawn because it parallels decline with, with the, the rising sun and the setting sun. Dawn, decline. Uh, the evening lands of Atlantis and the morning dawn of human culture. So I think if the book is ever translated, that's, that's what it should be called, the dawn of world history. And then so uh, Roger sent me, he translated the chart in the back of that book, where Spengler's model in his last days here, I don't know why he didn't finish this book. I, I get the sense, there's another book too that he didn't finish. I get the sense of him becoming lazy uh, in, in his last days and sort of just living on his laurels. He had all this money because um, The Decline of the West was a big bestseller. Um, so he had all this money and he was spending it on antique swords and weapons and books and antique this and antique that. So he was spending his way through it, but he was pretty comfortable. And it seems like well, he was losing his motivation, really, to get things done, because he had plenty of time on his hands. And I don't see any reason why he didn't finish these last books. Uh, I forget what the other one's called. But um, he was putting on a lot of weight, which leads me to suspect that he might have been drinking. Uh, I don't know that for sure. Uh, and he did die of a heart attack at, at the age of 56, so um, his later pictures, he, he does look like he's, he's putting on quite a bit of weight. Um, so I don't know why he didn't finish this, but it's called The Dawn of World History. So what he does is his model has changed now. He takes early prehistory into account, probably as a result of his meeting with Leo Frobenius, um, and divides human history into four phases, which he simply calls A, B, C, and D. <laughs> rather unimaginatively, uh, but he has great metaphors for them. Um, and I think he says, so on this chart, the first phase, he said, uh, lasts for 100,000 years, and its focus is on menschverdom, which means becoming human, or I guess in this case, mensch, menschenverdom, becoming human. But verdom has that Western destiny idea in it of weird, which means verden, which means to become. Uh, Young's individuation process also mean also means mensch, men, is mensch very dumb, which also means becoming an individual, but this is way too early for individuality to come in, according to him. And he describes this as small bands of humans, hunter-gatherers. Uh, these are probably Neanderthals that he's referring to here, I'm guessing. Primitive human consciousness arises for the first time in history. It is still formless and inorganic, however, and mainly an expression of the human senses. And so the metaphors are, uh, instead of plants, this phase corresponds to a, a volcano that erupts. Human consciousness suddenly appears on the stage, and it's molten and glowing. It's magmatic. So the metaphors, he says, thinking with one's hands, not with one's eyes, um, volcanic explosion, glowing hot, initial explosion of human consciousness, which then sets and hardens over time. So he has to be referring here to the Lower Paleolithic and the period of the Neanderthals. The Lower Paleolithic goes way back down about 2 million years, but the period of the Neanderthals goes back about to 600,000 years ago with Homo heidelbergensis in Europe. And they're already disposing of their dead at a pit in Spain called Atapuerca, uh, where they're throwing their dead into this hole inside of a cave. So they're already thinking about disposing of their dead. They don't really do anything cultural, though, the Neanderthals, until about 100,000 years ago. And this must be what Spengler is referring to. He says it lasts for 100,000 years. So the late Neanderthal period is when they start burying their dead in both Palestine and Europe. They have the cave bear cults, where they're collecting cave bear skulls and they're worshipping them. Uh, they've got shamans, most likely. Uh, no art, though, hence Spengler's insistence that they're thinking with their hands. It's a very tactile culture. It's not visual yet. There, there is no art. Um, so let's say he's talking about the Lower Paleolithic at the tail end of it there, of the last 100,000 years of it, 
with the Neanderthals. And then he's got B, uh, which he says the duration of which lasts for 10,000 years, and he calls this primitive cultures. And the form is, the natural world has been replaced by a human world now. Human groups have become much larger, and the first culture forms begin to appear. Humanity is still largely inorganic, with few culture forms, however. Uh, the metaphors are the human eyes taking over the thinking function from the human hand for the first time. This is the age of crystal now. The formless, the magmatic, the lava, let's say, hardens and develops into the first forms of consciousness. So the metaphor is crystal, uh, hardened crystal. And this must certainly refer to the creative explosion that took place 30,000 years ago with the upper Paleolithic and the arrival on stage of the modern Homo sapiens, what used to be called Cro-Magnon men, uh, who arrived coming up through Palestine, out of Africa, through Palestine, and into Europe. And I'm convinced that they genocidally wiped out the Neanderthals and raped their women. We do have Neanderthal genes. Um, so, and the human eye, of course, it begins to take over the hand because now with modern Homo sapiens coming in, we've got all this art. Chauvet is the earliest cave, 35,000 B.C., maybe, 33, 35. That seems to mark it. He's got a duration here of only 10,000 years, though, but this culture, if you mark it with Chauvet, which does indeed explode and light up the inside of these caves with these beautiful animal images, then this goes down to 35,000 down to about 14,000 B.C. with the melting of the glaciers that wipes everything out. Uh, the transformation of the whole ecology with the melting of the glaciers, the hunting to extinction of most of these beasts, uh, such as the cave bear, such as the woolly mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, all these kinds of creatures are hunted to extinction. Um, and then we get the melting of the glaciers. So you're like 35,000 down to 14,000. You're looking at about, it's a culture that's much longer than 10,000 years. It's more like 20,000. Um, so I've modified it that way. But then, loosely then, so we can refer to culture A, the lavic culture, as the lower Paleolithic, Neanderthal. Culture B is the upper Paleolithic, the coming in of Cro-Magnon men. And then we have culture C now, which lasts about 3,500 years, which is called the awakening of the individual toward the eye now. So he says, villages and tribes have arisen, especially villages, and this must certainly refer now to the Neolithic. These develop into the first political forms, the rise and creation of human languages and rational techniques and technique, the boat and the chariot are invented. Uh, the aspects give rise to a new human consciousness, thinking and speaking in words and inventing technologies. And the metaphors are language pierces human consciousness. Languages start to determine human thinking. I think he's late with this. I think this language goes way, way back. Um, Senses are replaced by language as the new dominant force in human consciousness. Cultures, so the new metaphor is amoebas. Cultures become amoebae, very expansionist and mobile, divisible and flowing. And he's got three of these. I remember from uh, reading this uh, way, uh, way back in college that he had three amoeba cultures. They do refer to the Neolithic, but 3,500 years is not long enough to cover, uh, to cover the, the Neolithic. He's got the Kosh culture which he says uh, wraps around from East Africa, uh, part of the Arabian Peninsula, and then around to India. And that's a culture based, uh, it's a very priestly oriented culture based on the worship of stone and megaliths. Um, then there's the other culture, which he calls Atlantis, but he doesn't mean by it the mythical Atlantis of Plato. It's just a term that he borrows to convey uh, this culture coming in uh, from along the, the shores of, um, I think, if I remember right, it's Western Europe and along the shores of the Mediterranean, pretty much, this other culture. Um, it's more of a warrior culture. It's not much of a priestly culture. And when the two meet in the Middle East, then we get uh, the first civilizations, the first generation of civilization, Egypt and uh, Sumer. Uh, and above that is the Tehran, what he calls the Tehran culture, which is simply the Indoarians a huge amoeba that stretches across Europe into Asia, um, a very huge amoeba that doesn't come in and become culturally creative really until the Toynbee's second generation of civilization, uh, which is marked by a chisora, uh, between the first generation and the second generation when all these Indorian and Indo-European groups 
um, come raiding in down on the ruins of the first generation and seed it with forms uh, that will become that will get the second generation up and running. So the Turanic culture arrives uh, from north to south much later, between 1700 BC, let's say, and 1200 BC. Um, so that's his map. The only problem here with the Neolithic is that the Neolithic has been divided into a much longer than 3500 year phase because it goes down to, it really goes back to 12,000 BC, but the pre-pottery Neolithic is demarcated as about 10,000 to 8,000 BC, roughly, loosely, and you have with that the rise of circular forms of architecture and uh, the rise of uh, villages, the first villages in, in uh, places in the, along the Euphrates uh, and in Turkey, Muraybet, uh, Abu Huraira, places like that that are already domesticating rye and einkorn. That gets up and running 10,000 to 8,000. And then from the pre-pottery Neolithic B is demarcated as about 8,000 or 8,500 or so down to 6,500 um, when circular architecture then is replaced by rectangular architecture um, and ancestor worship really uh, gets going in a big way. The skull cult is found everywhere. They're decorating skulls. They're worshiping the ancestral dead. Um, so it's an ancestor worship based society in that middle period there, probably in the first period too. Then we get the pottery Neolithic 6500 BC, which goes down then to the birth of civilization in the Near East about 3500. Um, there used to be a calcolithic in there, uh, a copper uh, period when they're smelting copper before they've mixed it with tin to make bronze, uh, about 4500 BC down to 3500 BC. But the pottery Neolithic is interesting because the demarcation point of 6500 BC seems to mark a Chisora, also where there was a catastrophe. There is evidence, and I remember from reading this in Jacques uh, Coban's book about the Middle East, he's an excellent first-rate archaeologist, a French archaeologist, um, and is a, an authority on the Neolithic. And he was talking about, it looks like there must have been some sort of a catastrophe around 7000 BC, um, because at that time, all of these villages go out. Uh, all across the Middle East, they just stop, they disappear, and there are a few villages that remain, and one of them that remains is highly suspicious because it's called Ein Gazal, huge ancestor worship at Ein Gazal. They have these interesting uh, ancestor figures of, with reed, uh, reed frames and lime plastered over with cowrie shells for the eyes, creepy looking. Uh, but this place was on higher ground than most of these other sites. So we have to start to wonder, was there a flood here? Uh, was there a bolide? Did a meteorite? hit somewhere nearby and cause a huge catastrophe? Nobody knows. But there does appear to be a chisura, and the population, furthermore, of Ein Gazal doubled overnight. Um, so it looks like they, were, they took in a bunch of refugees, and then when they did that, it, it's like I put a bunch of weight on the site, and it, it went downhill. It, it just went, they stopped doing their culture forms and their ancestor statues not too long after that. But 6500 BC then, pottery proper is invented with the two-chambered kiln, higher temperatures are enabled. Cremation of the dead comes in now for the first time. So we have what uh, the independent scholar, whom I admire very much, Mary Setegast, um, uh, calls pyrotechnologies. Both cremation of the dead and the smelting of metals is also coming in. They're, they're starting to play around with metals. And, um, and they're making pottery, very fine pottery. Samaran pottery in the Middle East and Halafian in the North in Asia Minor uh, in the area of Turkey. Very fine pottery, absolutely fantastic. Um, and the ancestor cult sort of starts to die out. They stop removing heads, and the, the skull cult pretty much falls out and disappears during the pottery Neolithic. So it's a different culture that's coming in with new technologies that are more sophisticated, and it's headed for civilization, um, which happens 3500 BC. That is still the date in, in Sumer. So Spengler's mo model there has to be modified by these uh, recently known facts. So his four-phase model of history then uh, pretty much corresponds, the lava phase corresponds to the lower Neolithic, in the, or the lower uh, Paleolithic and Neanderthals, uh, then the crystal phase then would correspond to the upper Paleolithic and the coming in of the cro -Magnons. and then the middle phase, um, the phase of uh, uh, amoebas, corresponds to the Neolithic, although it's much longer than 3,500 years. 
um, since it goes back to 12,000 and comes down to 3,500. That's a long period of culture forms um, transforming. And then we get the rise of high civilization uh, 3,500 years ago, um, or 3,500 BC, rather. Um, and then we get the plant morphology. Plant morphology, he says, human organization has become an organic structure with a predetermined biological lifespan. Uh, so it's interesting, as you look at his model, as it flows over time, it shifts from uh, a mineralogical mo metaphor with lava first exploding, magmatic, glowing human consciousness, and then it hardens into a crystalline form, uh, and then it shifts to a biological model with these first culture forms in the Neolithic, which he calls an analogous to amoebae, and they have very long lifespans, thousands of years rather than 1,000 years, uh, and they cover vast geographic territories, so they're sort of elastic, like amoebae, uh, and they're not as highly organized as a plant. And then with high civilization, we get the plant model that comes in. Uh, he never abandoned that model. So decline of the West is his archaeological sort of analysis of phase D here, uh, which is the phase of the high cultures. So he added these three previous epochs. So I thought it would be interesting to go over those to see how his model expands and changes over time. And that's thanks to Roger Mull, who, sent, who translated that chart and sent it uh, to me. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Okay, so now um, I'm going to return to where we left off in Decline of the West on destiny and causality. Um, he says, It is the primitive feeling of care which dominates the physiognomy of Western, as also that of Egyptian and that of Chinese history, and it creates further the symbolism of the erotic, which represents the flowing out or the flowing on of endless life in the form of the familial series of individual existences, the point formed Euclidean existence of classical man, in this matter, as in others, conceived only the here and now definitive act of begetting or bearing, and thus it comes about that we find the birth pangs of the mother made the center of Demeter worship and the Dionysic symbol of the phallus the sign of a sexuality wholly concentrated on the moment and losing past and future in it. Uh, more or less everywhere in the classical, in the Indian world we find correspondingly the sign of the lingam and the sect of worshippers of Parvati, and, and this is also Shiva. Shiva corresponds to Dionysus. They are both symbolized by erect fallacies. Um, Parvati is the first consort of Shiva, I believe. Um, in the one case, as in the other, Man feels himself as nature, as a plant, as a willless and careless element of becoming. The domestic religion of Rome centered on the genius, i.e. the creative power of the head of the family. To all this, the deep <coughs> and thoughtful care of the Western soul has opposed the sign of mother love, a symbol which, in the classical culture, only appeared above the horizon to the extent that we see it in, say, the morning for Persephone, or, though this is only Hellenistic, the seated statue of Demeter, Demeter of Canidos. The mother with the child, the future at her breast, the Mary cult in the new Faustian form began to flourish only in the centers of the Gothic and found its highest expression in Raphael's Sistine Madonna. Uh, this conception is not one belonging to Christianity generally. On the contrary, Magian Christianity had elevated Mary as Theotokos, which means God-bearer, she who gives birth to a god, Theotokos, like a token. A token is a coin with an image of a deity or an emperor on it, Theotokos, God-bearer. Which was at the council, interestingly enough, this was declared at the council of Ephesus, the ancient city of the mother goddess. Ephesus was where the many-breasted Artemis Diana statue comes from, um, and this was in 431 AD, where they declared her officially, she is the mother of a god or the god, um, into a symbol, uh, whoops, into it, let's see, into, into a symbol fault quite otherwise than by us. The lulling mother is as alien to early Christian Byzantine art as she is to the Hellenic, though for other reasons, and most certainly Faust's Gretchen, with the deep spell of unconscious motherhood on her, is nearer to the Gothic Madonna than all the Marys of Byzantine and Ravenate mosaics, Indeed, the presumption of a spiritual relation between them breaks down completely before the fact that 
The Madonna with the Child answers exactly to the Egyptian Isis with Horus. Both are caring, nursing mothers. And that never, nevertheless, this symbol had vanished for a thousand years and more, for the whole duration of the classical and the Arabian cultures, before it was reawakened by the Faustian soul. Now, um, he's saying that um, Mary with the Christ Child on her lap uh, is similar to uh, Isis with Horus on her lap. But as a matter of fact, we now have evidence, we know that that image, which becomes picked up by the Byzantine civilization from Egypt, is a transformation into Christianity of Isis with Horus. There are direct connections with Egypt. I think there's a church there. There was a, a spot of worship somewhere in Egypt, and I've forgotten the locality where they, it, was a, it was an Isis cult that was there, and then later they built a church sacred to Mary on that spot. So we know that uh, Isis with Horus on her lap is transformed by the Byzantines into their image of the Madonna with the child on the lap, and then it gets passed to Faustian civilization. I don't know, perhaps through the Crusades. The Fourth Crusade was fought against uh, Byz Byzantium in about 1200 uh, AD. But now I see the significance a little differently from how he sees this. Um, in a way, uh, and I see the, that icon of Mary with the Christ child on her lap, which becomes the inspiration for the Mary cults of, let's say, from 1200 to 1300 or so, where they start building all the cathedrals. Notre Dame, Our Mother, um, in their, their cathedrals that are sacred to the mother. And they have all the Mary cults. Uh, women are worshipped in the Troubadourian, in the secular literature of the Troubadourian romances and so forth. Uh, but the key thing is that image with the young child on this mother's lap. Because I see the West as the Western deities and icons are aging in reverse. We have with the Old Testament the bearded old grizzled man portrayed for us in our mind's eye forever by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. We will never think of Yahweh in any other way than as Michelangelo portrayed him and apotheosized him on the Sistine ceiling. This grizzled old man, the Old Testament. Uh, then we get the New Testament in which the focus now shifts to his son, who's a much younger man, who's crucified at the age of 33, so he dies as a young man. Uh, and then we get with these Faustian Mary cults that spring up and become popular around 1200, the Christ child. Uh, so there has been an aging in reverse as the West has moved, as civilization and culture has moved from East to West. And there has been uh, an acceptance of novelty over ancestor worship. The West likes change. And this is the wonder child. Uh, this is also traced genealogically from Achilles to the Christ child. There's a genealogy there in which we prefer the kid. The kid will come up with something new in his garage. Uh, Steve Jobs will save us. He'll come up with some new gadget. Uh, let's watch the kid. Watch the kids out there playing in the street because they're going to come up with some. They'll walk in with some brilliant invention. That's not... <laughs> civilization was never like that. It was always... Contrast that with Chinese civilization where not a single one of the deities... If you look at... Get a book on Chinese mythology. Flip through it, especially one with images. They're all old men. Every single one of those Chinese figures are these grizzled old men, except for goddesses like Nuqua, who are young and beautiful, because they have to be, because they, they have to be young to be beautiful. So that's the only reason that the goddesses are young. Um, but the, the men are all like Glatsu. Uh, they all look like you know Leonardo or something. They have no conception of the youth as having anything to offer. The elders are whom you need to listen to. Uh, filial piety, respect for one's ancestors. This is all apotheosized in Confucius's text, The Analects. Read that. All, all it is is a peon to the ancestors, to the elders. You cannot commit crimes against your parents. If you do, uh, you will be killed, pretty much, put to death. Uh, they take it very seriously. Kids have no say in culture. There's no interest in them whatsoever. So it's really highly significant that uh, the Greeks are the, well, actually the Minoans, the Minoans in the West are the first to let go of the old guy. If you look at Minoan art, and Minoan art is a different civilization from Egypt. It's not the same society. Um, it, it was heavily in contact with Egypt, but it's its own unique novel society, 2500 BC, and it's up and running for about a thousand years. Look at the art. Look at all Minoan art. There's not one single old man depicted anywhere in that art. You will not find a man with a beard anywhere. 
in the Noan art. It's all beautiful young women with bearing their breasts. Uh, it's a very erotically charged society. It's based on youth and sex uh, and Olympic games, jumping over bulls. Um, this is a highly sexually charged society, very erotic, very turned toward the youth and the new. And I think it's, it's the, it paves the way. Across the water there, on the Greek peninsula, if you look at the Mycenaeans uh, in their graves like the mask of Atreus, um, that's that guy, it's a gold mask, and he's got a beard. So in the north, the Mycenaeans, who are the Greeks, they are proto-Greek. There's no question of that. Uh, we've translated their, their script, and they have Greek gods referred to. Um, so they're just a different phase of the Greeks, an, Indo -Aryan, an early Indo-Aryan phase of the Greeks, uh, bringing a different culture in with ancestor worship, a very strong hero cult. Uh, and they're still deferring to, to elders, unlike the Minoans. But the thing is that the Mycenaeans were essentially barbarians living in the equivalent of what Spengler calls the stronghold castle fortifications, exactly like, like the castles of the Middle Ages. They're just these sort of barbarian war bands who look up to the, the Minoans and worship them. And the Greeks have remembered their great engineers, who were far superior to the Mycenaeans in the myth of Daedalus, who uh, is looked at with awe and wonder and fear. He's a very mysterious figure. You can't trust this myth. He murders his uh, nephew, Talus, just because he's jealous of him, because Talus invented the first saw. So he pushes him off a cliff. Then he has to leave Athens and go live in, in Crete. And there he invents the labyrinth. So... Uh, Greek civilization remembers the mightiness of the creativity of the Minoans, whom the Mycenaeans looked up to, and they got all their culture forms from, from the Minoans. So I think over time, that process of those two cultures interacting also produced, uh, introduced this cult of the youth from, coming from the Minoans. And then when the Doric Greeks get there, um, and they erase the Minoan cult of the dead, wipe it out. It's, it's been already wiped out by most likely by the Sea Peoples, who have already gotten in there 1200 BC, destroyed the Mycenaean civilization. Uh, so by the time the Doric Greeks get there, there's not really much to take over. They just settle in these ruins and regard these people. Who were these people? They must have been pretty heroic because they've got huge stone blocks that they've built, you know, the palace of Tiryns and Pylos and all these places. Um, so the Doric Greeks must have come, I don't know whether they would have come with the cult of the Wonder Child with them, or if it just somehow radiates, emanates like radiation from the Minoans somehow, and they pick it up by the time you get to the Iliad. Achilles 750 is indeed the West's first wonder child. He is the youngest of all the heroes in that epic. He's probably about 20, 21, 22, maybe 23 at the oldest. Um, and he is indeed uh, a wonder to behold, and he is a wunderkind. He's the prototype and archetype in the West for the wunderkind, and the Iliad is all about his war against the grizzled old Ag uh, Agamemnon, who makes one mistake, strategic mistake after the next, that gets the Greeks in trouble with the Trojans, um, and which is why he's sulking in his tent through most of the epic, watching Agamemnon fuck everything up uh, until it's time with the murder of Patroclus for him to come out and, and show him how it's done. That's the kid. The kid. The kid will show us how it's done. And so the West, ever since, our idea of the, the deity has indeed aged in reverse, um, and the kid has the new thing. That's the difference between the West and the East, is the wonder child versus the elders. Um, so then Spangler says, from the maternal care, the way leads to the paternal, and there we meet with the highest of all the time symbols that have come into existence within a culture, the state. The meaning of the child to the mother is the future the continuation, namely, of her own life, and mother love is, as it were, a welding of two discontinuous individual existences. Likewise, the meaning of the state to the man is comradeship in arms for the protection of hearth and home, wife and child, and for the insurance for the whole people of its future and its efficacy. The state is the inward form of a nation, its form in the athletic sense, and history in the high meaning is the state conceived as kinesis and not as kinema. Um, the woman as mother is and the man as warrior and politician makes history. And here again, the history of higher cultures shows us three examples of state formations in which the element of care is conspicuous. The Egyptian administration, even of the Old Kingdom from 3000 BC, the Chinese state of the Zhou Dynasty, 1169 to 256 BC, 
of the organization of which uh, the Joe Lee gives such a picture that later on, no one dared to believe in the authenticity of the book and the states of the West, behind whose characteristic eye to the future there is an unsurpassably intense will to the future. And on the other hand, we have in two examples, the classical and the Indian world, a picture of utterly careless submission to the moment and its incidents, and in both of those cultures, a worship of the phallus over the vagina, over the great mother. That's interesting because the phallus does not represent the future, it's pure present. When you're having an orgasm, time does not exist. You are purely present. Uh, there is no past, there is no future. Uh, so it's interesting that both of those cultures have uh, phallus worship in Shiva and Dionysus, and that the West does not. The West worships the vagina. Um, feminism is already inevitable, with given those premises at the beginning of the civilization with the Mary cults. Different in themselves, as are Stoicism and Buddhism, uh, the old age dispositions of these two worlds, they are at one in their negation of the historical feeling of care, their contempt of zeal, of organizing power, and of the duty sense. And therefore, neither in Indian courts nor in classical marketplaces was there a thought for the moral, personal or collective. The carpe diem of Apollonian man applies also to the Apollonian state. As with the political, so with the other side of historical existence, the economic, the hand-to-mouth life corresponds to the love that begins and ends in the satisfaction of the moment. There was an economic organization on the grand scale in Egypt where it fills the whole culture picture, telling us in a thousand paintings the story of its industry and orderliness. In China, whose mythology of gods and legend emperors turns entirely upon the holy tasks of cultivation, and in Western Europe where, beginning with the model agriculture of the orders, it rose to the height of a special science, national economy, which was, in very principle, a working hypothesis purporting to show not what happens, but what shall happen. In the classical world, on the other hand, to say nothing of India, men managed from day to day. In spite of the example of Egypt, the earth was robbed not only of its wealth, but of its capacities, and the casual surpluses were instantly squandered on the city mob. Consider critically any great statesman of the classical, Pericles and Caesar, Alexander and Scipio, and even revolutionaries like Cleon and Tiberius Gracchus, not one of them economically looked far ahead. No city ever made it its business to drain or to a forest, a district, or to introduce advanced cultivation methods or new kinds of livestock or new plants. To attach a Western meaning to the agrarian reform of the Gracchi is to misunderstand its purport entirely. Their aim was to make their supporters possessors of land, of educating these into managers of land, or of raising the standard of Italian husbandry in general. There was not the remotest idea one let the future come, one did not attempt to work upon it. Of this economic stoicism of the classical world, the exact antithesis is socialism, meaning thereby not Marx's theory, but Frederick William I's Prussian practice, which long preceded Marx and will yet displace him, the socialism inwardly akin to the system of old Egypt that comprehends and cares for permanent economic relations, trains the individual in his duty to the whole, and glorifies hard work as an affirmation of time and future. And the Gracchi, in case you don't know who they are, Tiberius Gracchus and his brother Caius Gracchus, uh, rather remind me a bit of the Kennedy brothers. Um, their drama took place not too long after the Punic Wars, after the Third Punic War, and the Romans have finished uh, conquering the, all the peoples pretty much at that point that they're going to conquer, just, just for that point, before Caesar sets off to Gaul and so forth, and Pompey does all his conquests of the Middle East. Um, so they've got the Mediterranean under lock and key, pretty much. Uh, and then the civil unrest starts. And basically, the Gracchi event eventually leads to the civil wars. It's, it's the beginning of the decay of Rome's internal uh, civic structure. Uh, Tiberius Gracchus uh, wanted these land reforms. He wanted land returned to the people who originally owned them or displaced soldiers. He wanted these land reforms, uh, and it very much upset the wealthy classes, the patricians. He was for the plebeians. Um, and so they murdered this guy in broad daylight in the middle of the Senate. The, the, the senators beat this guy to death in the forum. Imagine that. Nothing like that had ever happened in Rome up to that point. It's, in my opinion, it's morphologically analogous to the assassination of Kennedy. And then about ten years later or so, his, his brother, who was agitating again, for the exact same things. Caius Gracchus, then he's murdered. Um, 
And that begins a slow process of setting off the decay of Rome into their civil wars. Uh, from, from there on, it's, it's downhill.